It's our job to figure out what those conversations need to look like so that people see the larger disarmament arms control work and the policies that we'd want to move forward as really meaningfully um, connected to things that they're seeing every day. That's the voice of Lynn Fossil, co-founder and executive director of Rethink Media. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button for our 73rd episode. A special welcome to Tom, who joins us again after a well-deserved vacation. It is great to have you back. Thanks, Michelle. It's great to be back in the virtual recording studio with you. And I'm reporting from socially distant New Hampshire. And this is an exciting week for Plowshares Fund as Dr. Emma Belcher begins her first week as Plowshares Fund's new president. Congratulations! You'll be hearing from her on the podcast soon, but to learn more, you can visit our website, plowshares.org. And Michelle, what do you have lined up for us today? First up on our early warning segment, we talk about racism in the U.S. nuclear community and lay out steps we each can take to make real progress. I'm joined by Dr. Lauren Borja and Dr. Caitlin Turner, two nuclear security experts who recently penned a call for anti-racist action and accountability in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. After that, I'm joined by co-founder and executive director of Rethink Media, Lynn Fossil, who challenges us to dramatically reshape the conversation around nuclear weapons in order to build the public constituency we need to create lasting change. It's not a conversation you want to miss. And finally, we answer a question sent to us by Frank from Germany. Thank you, Frank, in our Q&A segment. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, tweet or direct message us at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. We love hearing from you. As always, please click the subscribe button and give us a rating. And if you like the show this week, Please tell just one person about it. Your support makes what we do possible. With that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dell. Today, I'm delighted to welcome two new guests to our show, Dr. Lauren Borja, a former Stanton Fellow, and Dr. Caitlin Turner, a research scientist in the Space Enabled Research Group at the MIT Media Lab. Thank you both for joining. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So as you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear news, since that's about the amount of time a U.S. president would have to decide whether to respond to an incoming nuclear strike in kind. And our seven minutes starts now. Lauren, Caitlin, last week you, along with three other co-authors, published a compelling article in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists calling for anti-racist action and accountability in the U.S. nuclear community. You lay out how systemic racism in the nuclear field is produced and sustained in two different but connected ways. Epistemic racism, seen at how the field was built, the purposes and the use of the nuclear bomb and exploitation of people of color, which is seen in the field's foundations. And you also talk about institutional racism, which involves the ways the nuclear community and its organizations create barriers to black and non-black professionals of color um, to fully participate in the field. What were the key lessons you took away from the history as you wrote this article? Um, I think that one lesson that we took away was that, um, which I think is really relevant also to the conversation happening in the United States, is that we keep seeing this disconnect of like the norms that many of us hold dearly and value today with the actual policies and practices and the outcomes that they produce. And the reason that those disparities are there is, you know, sometimes because of people who want those disparities to exist, but more likely it's because, you know, a lot of these policies were created during a time where it was very normal to and embraced to have racist and colonialist ideas about 
different types of people. And so when you create a system, um, you don't just create the parts and the, you know, the parts of the reactor or of the bomb, but you create the norms, you create the legal systems, you create um, barriers for people to get in, how they determine their expertise and things like that. And at the time that the nuclear field was created, like many other systems in our country and in our world, the norms at that time were very blatantly racist, very blatantly colonialist, very blatantly sexist, all of the things. So it's no surprise that we see that today. And we, we see like acknowledging this as like an important first step too that we wanted to bring to the conversation. And many other people are also talking about this and acknowledging this, but we wanted to use this article as a starting point for people hoping to engage with these ideas further. You write in the piece that anti-racism begins with accountability, honesty, and vulnerability. And you provide a variety of ideas for anti-racist actions, both institutional and individual, that nuclear practitioners can take. And this includes starting by collecting and publishing data, rethinking job requirements, getting rid of unpaid internships, and this relying on fellowships as an entry point into the field, as well as several other first steps. What changes to you will really feel like progress when you begin to see them? I think that um, from an epistemic level, it would be great to have every nuclear engineering department have a class that very explicitly talks about the sociological uh, sort of consequences and ramifications of the nuclear enterprise. Um, it would be great to see professors who are hired in those departments and not just hired, but supported and get tenure um, who work on that sort of epistemic issue, right? A lot of the issues in this epistemology are that, as we say, when knowledge like this is produced, it's not valued, it's not seen as nuclear, it's not seen as worthy of tenure at Michigan or Berkeley or wherever. So I think that would be a really great thing. Um, but then in terms of the institutional racism, I think what would be awesome is, you know, as a starting point, like we point out in the article that if you look at the, you know, sort of academic gatekeeping mechanisms of education of in STEM, the nuclear field actually lags behind other STEM disciplines. Um, so other STEM disciplines have these issues as well. But when you're talking about um, underrepresented minorities in the United States, nuclear fields like are, are very low in terms of their representation. So I think that would be, um, you know, over a five to 10 year period, if you have sustained gains in that area, then you're probably showing that you didn't just have a one-off year where you decided, oh, let's recruit a bunch of minorities this year to save face, but you've actually made systemic changes in your department and you're able to support those individuals through their degrees. Yeah, agreed. To be clear, I, I don't have a nuclear engineering degree. I actually came into this field through those other STEM Degrees, and I think also, you know, broadening this to a larger STEM audience would be useful, although possibly beyond the scope of both this article and our work. <laughs> but um, yeah, I also wanted to echo Kate's comments about looking at the gatekeeping mechanisms uh, in academic institutions, which often train the professionals we see going on to other jobs, but even in other institutions as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, people often hear like, well, you know, you just didn't do this or you didn't do that. And it's a way of making it seem like these things are meritocracies when, in fact, from day one, sometimes you show up and like, who gets chosen to be a co-author on a paper that then goes on their CV that then allows them to talk about that? You know, these things don't just happen in a bubble, but they often go unacknowledged and get attributed to merits that aren't different between different people. In our final minute, I loved how this article was really the work of a group. Yourselves, along with your co-authors, Denya Jokic, Medikin Monk, and Aditi Verma. How did that collaboration come about? That was very intentional. We wanted to try to bring um, many young people of color to the table to talk about these issues, especially people who have expertise in this field. Um, and we also tried, I don't know, uh, throughout the rest of the article, if this is obvious, to try to cite and 
keep those citations for work that is ongoing in the field because you know a lot of this action um, could be as simple as broadening your horizons and engaging with existing scholarship. Yeah, and we should add too. So we additionally tried. We asked um, several people to you know whether they wanted to contribute to the article or be co-authors um, and help you know shape the article. Many of our colleagues of color who we did ask um, gave us the feedback that, you know, sometimes that this piece didn't go far enough, um, that it needed to be more uh, direct. And then many of them also said that they could not put their names on an article like this for fear that they would suffer professional retaliation. Um, and so that actually was a really sobering thing to hear. And I think it's important for the community to hear that you know, this is, there are people who, for whatever reason, um, for whatever very real reason, for a lot of the reasons that we point out in the second half of the article, um, feel that they're actually silenced in trying to make changes. Um, so I think there's a lot of there's a lot of people whose names are not on this article, but who were very much involved. Well, with that, our seven minutes are up. Lauren, Caitlin, thank you so much for joining. Lynn Fosselt is the co-founder and executive director of Rethink Media, an organization that works to build communications capacity across movements. Lynn brings 25 years of experience in media analysis, organizational development, strategic planning, and message development. She is a gender champion in nuclear policy and has served as a communications consultant to Fenton Communications, Plowshares Fund, the Carnegie Corporation, the Peace and Security Initiative, the Open Society Institute, and many others. Lynn, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Michelle. So to begin, you know, I hear a lot of stories from people on why peace and security, but you have this also added focus on communications. How did you get into this? Um, it's interesting because somebody in an interview a couple weeks ago asked me the same thing, and it was kind of good to always go back to how you started and, and why you ended up in this place, in particular around nuclear disarmament issues, because there aren't a lot of women in this field, and it was not like a hot topic when I was in college in terms of the protests or organizing that were going on. And um, I think it was like my junior year in college, I read the book Hiroshima by John Hersey, and there's just images that will never leave my mind. I think it was like 8 a.m., 8.15 in the morning when we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. And I have these the images of a woman hanging her clothes out on a line, a man going to work, a couple getting their kids up. And I just, you know, the book just completely floored me. I just thought, you know, how could we have made a decision that resulted in over 100,000 innocent civilians being killed in a matter of seconds? Um, and for me, just the hubris and arrogance that any difference nationally or institutionally or internationally would be worth just ending 100,000 lives in a minute. To me, I just felt like there's no issue I'll ever be able to work on to make a difference until we get rid of the notion that anything we uh, have differences about would be worthy of dropping such a weapon. And then instead of like, recoiling in horror at what this weapon did. We dropped another one. And then another piece is just, oh, my first job anyways was canvassing on nuclear disarmament issues as soon, soon as I got out of college. So I spoke to over 15,000 people at their doors to kind of convince them as well that this was the issue that really put all other issues on the table. Um, and I have this magazine uh, on my desk. It's a pretty grim magazine. It's from Colors they did a series on war in 1996. I've kept this grim book on my desk. When I canvassed, I took it with me every night canvassing. And it kind of goes through all of the different global conflicts that were happening at the time. But each page, I don't know if you ever saw it, but each page has what weapons are being used in each conflict, what's the dominant weapon being used, how it was designed um, is on one page. Now the other page is what it does to the human body. Like it's specifically designed to do certain things to the human body. And to me, I just thought if we put this level of innovation and smarts into like any number of things, climate change, 
um, controlling and fighting disease, ending racism and sexism, if we put half of the um, ingenuity that we've put into the design of weapons, not to mention the money that we put into the design of those weapons, then we would just have a much different world. Um, so I've worked on the issues ever since. Um, and the reason for communications, you know, I came to this work because of a book, because of a magazine, you know, that I read. They introduced the gravity of the issue in a way that made me want to organize um, as effectively as possible. And maybe the next person that I interview is going to be someone who watched one of the 8.1 million people that watched the Chernobyl series. Like the way these issues become personal to us is not, we go to be experts on something we care about, but we have to care about it first. So in this policy-centric world, what do you see as the, the biggest communications challenges, um, trends, things that you know experts like myself should be paying attention to if we want our message to get out there? Well, the two, the two things that I would say is kind of 101 of communications or strategic communications or even organizing one is um, every issue we work on, we look at voice share. So if our arguments are not being heard, they may be the best arguments out there and they may be really compelling to audiences, but if they're not being heard, then they're not going to be able to compete up against our opposition's messaging. And when I first got into communications in the peace and security field, the first media analysis and audit that we did of this sector showed that on the opinion pages where most people define and learn about different positions on issues, that we were being beat three to one by our opposition. So for every one argument we made for arms control and disarmament, our opposition was making two um, and also calling ours naive. So until we reach parity in terms of our solutions, I know our solutions are better than theirs. I know they're more effective than theirs, but reaching an audience that sees that there's two choices here and the disarmament arms control and the decision to never use these weapons again is, is what we need to reach people on. And I've also seen, you know, we've had debates within the peace and security disarmament field for the entire time that I've been in it about an insider game for policy analysis and legislators who know all about these issues because they're too complex for the public. But you can win, you know, a page added in or a paragraph added in or a legislation that most people don't understand added in, but then it can just as quickly be taken away if you don't have a powerful constituency um, to back up that policy and make it so that legislators aren't willing to compromise on it because they know the public won't let them compromise on it. So the voice share, us being heard in our messages and our arguments being the more compelling ones is what leads to true victories, but long lasting victories. And then the second kind of 101 version of communications and organizing is that the messenger matters. You know, we reach audiences by having those audiences as part of our movement, as part of our leaders, our policymakers, our researchers, um, our spokespeople. And 50% of our constituency is women and 80% of our spokespeople are men. So if we want to reflect and build a powerful, potent um, movement on these issues, then we really have to reflect the audiences that we're trying to reach. So how do we change that? And this is, I, I guess, gets to the, the work of, of rethink and, and why you do what you do. But I, I'm assuming that, you know, these are things that we can change. So the example I gave when I when we first did the audit in the field on the three to one imbalance of opinion and editorial coverage, we called all the groups together. We showed them the data on the gap across all of the states. We picked out which states we had spokespeople and which ones we didn't and made a two year strategy to close that gap. And we took completely 100% close that gap. So for us, it's like bring the data to the table. We all own the data. We understand what it means for building our movement. And we jointly come up with a coordinated strategy to close the exact same gap. We see people like the women of color advancing peace and security, a whole new generation of women um, experts on this issue, their voices need to be front and center in this debate and in this conversation. We see WAND, um, Women Actions for New Directions, has started this whole new program. One of the research findings that we did on nuclear weapons was that the most concerned audience that we heard from was Latino women. They were most concerned, most interested in finding out more. That was a big surprise to us, but that initiative came about because of it. It's now connecting new up-and-coming women in peace and security fields 
skills with mentors to ensure that we have a whole new generation of Latino women working on this issue. It's there, it's doable. We have to put the resources and the ingenuity into it and it'll happen. What do you think Besides this, uh, the gender, racial, and ethnic diversity gap that we see, what what are the other major challenges that you think that the nuclear policy field in particular needs to wake up to when it comes to communications and really adapt to this new environment? I think I'd say two things. Uh, we had this one study that we did. We called it stuck in neutral. Um, I don't know if you meant you remember it, but this is one thing we've done media audits and analysis across all of the issue areas that we work. And we've never seen it so much as we've seen it in the peace and security field. And being stuck in neutral is um, people kind of get into an expert view, a policymaker view, an academic view, where the using persuasive communications to make your arguments more compelling than the opposition so that we win the day on disarmament. Um, all of a sudden, it, it kind of feels like we're there to give facts. We're there to answer questions, give context. And so that means that all of our quotes get coded as neutral. Um, versus positively advocating and offering solutions to the public on a really scary topic. They're scared by it. They care about it. But unless they feel there's a solution and that we have a way forward, it shuts people down. So the stuck and neutral, one of the things that came out of the recent gender data that we found really surprising is we traced the difference between male and female spokespeople over the last 10 years. And year after year, the women spokespeople spoke more positively and with agency and a solution than the male spokespeople did. So that is like a really big challenge. I'm not saying it will be solved by um, diversifying um, more women in the field, but it looks like if we get to that parity, we'll also have a lot more messaging that really tells people a solution in a direction that they can go. So taking a, another step back and just looking at the media landscape today, I, you know, we've talked about how crowded it is, how every week it feels like there is another story. How does peace and security break through in a moment like this? And or does it does it connect to the other issues? But how do, how do we operate in, in this moment where, you know, stories go by so fast and, you know, what goes on politically is really what's what's taking up the most bandwidth? It's probably overly apparent, but our issues have to be connected to what's happening around us and they have to feel relevant um, to those conversations. So if the same type of weapons development militarism is what's driving police violence against African-American community members or black men, is that connected in some way to the military? Is the amount of money that we put into weapons and uh, militarism far enough could have been used to resolve half of these conflicts. It could have extended benefits to people to stay at home for another year or two even. Um, it could address a lot of the disparities that we're seeing that um, are really capturing the news in this, in this time. But I think they're very much connected. It's our job to figure out what those conversations need to look like so that people see the larger disarmament arms control work and the policies that we'd want to move forward as really meaningfully um, connected to things that they're seeing every day. Lynn, before we go, what do you see as the most pressing communications challenge right now? I think it's really all about um, reaching a much broader constituency. I mean, I've said this already, but I think that that is the most important thing for the sector to tackle. In some of our recent messaging and voice share, we're seeing a much larger number of spokespeople and more people entering this field. It is, despite the numbers, more diverse than when I started. I was the only woman director um, for many of those years. If it wouldn't have been for Sally Lilienthal um, and her investment in our work, and she's a huge Shiro of mine. She would like ask so many hard questions, hard hitting, most scary like interviews around grants. But she was also the really the best in terms of creative thoughts and really strategic and organizing and thinking outside the box. So I think we need to have those folks in the field to keep others in the field um, as long as I have. So I think communications is a huge part of that. Well, 
I am also a huge fan of Sally Lilienthal, the founder of Plowshares, and we're just about to go into our 40th anniversary, so her her legacy continues on. Lynn, thank you so much for joining. Of course. Thank you. And now, everyone's favorite nuclear question and answer segment. This week's question comes from Frank in Germany and will be answered by our very own Tom Kalina, policy director here at Plowshares Fund. Frank asks, if the United States continues its trend of withdrawing from arms control and non-proliferation agreements and increasing its spending on nuclear weapons, what could European allies do in order to reduce the risks of nuclear war and nuclear proliferation. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks, Frank, for that question. Uh, We could see the beginning of a new U.S.-Russian nuclear arms race that would see uh, Europe and NATO right in between uh, that crisis. We could see a, a resumption of a Middle East arms race. And we could see the wholesale collapse of non-proliferation efforts, uh, for example, the collapse of the non-proliferation treaty. So I think uh, without the United States being the voice of arms control and non-proliferation, Europe has to step up and play that role. And this will be a challenge for Europe because I think over the past four years, uh, Europe and our allies there have tried to kind of have it both ways to remain uh, friendly with the Trump administration for obvious reasons, but at the same time, uh, try to counter the administration as it pulls away from arms control agreements such as the Iran nuclear deal. And I think that balance will be harder to maintain in a second Trump administration. And, and I would certainly like to see uh, our European allies take the Trump administration on on these issues um, and, uh, and, and start making some noise. So specifically, we would need to see Europe uh, step up to stop a new U.S.-Russian arms race, uh, to stop an arms race in the Middle East, and to save the non-proliferation regime and the NPT specifically. And three ways that they could do that is, is one, to support the extension of the New START treaty. Uh, I think in this case, our European allies really have to become more vocal. This is an essential component of European security. And in a second Trump administration, our European allies need to make it clear that the New START treaty needs to be extended. Second, the Iran nuclear deal. Clearly, Europe has an interest in saving this deal. They've been trying to balance the interests of the Trump administration and Iran uh, for the last few years. Uh, I think if Trump is reelected, European allies are really going to have to uh, be more clear about the need of saving the Iran nuclear deal and working directly with Iran uh, to save the deal and constrain Iran's nuclear program, regardless of what the Trump administration does. And finally, uh, I think the best thing Europe could do to save the nonproliferation regime and the nonproliferation treaty is to support the treaty on their prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, This is a UN treaty approved just a few years ago. Uh, It'll enter into force sometime this year or next. It prohibits legally um, all nuclear weapons. European allies have been reluctant to support this agreement. Uh, Certainly the Trump administration is not going to support this agreement. But I think support for that treaty uh, is the best way to shore up support within the nonproliferation treaty for arms control and disarmament. Uh, So let's hope our European allies go in that direction. Another week, another question. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, Frank. And remember, if you would like to get your question on the air, Tweet or DM us at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Zender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Zender. Audio engineering by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music 
by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.